Hello, this is Amir Ali Alibhai, welcoming you to at the Aga Khan Museum on Ismaili TV. And we're into the month of March. And uh, for many of us around the world, this is a time when spring is beginning and the nature is coming back to life. So we thought we would devote today's episode to spring, to rebirth, to renewal and to the natural world. We start off this episode with a short piece by Dr. Ulrika Alchamis, a uh, curator from Home Piece that uh, we featured last year. We're back in that mode of uh, many of us working from home in Toronto, so I thought it would be appropriate for us to begin this episode with uh, Dr. Alchamis's short talk on bunnies and eggs. Enjoy. Hello, everybody. I am Ulrika al Khamis, Director of Collections and Public Programs at the Aga Khan Museum. And I thought while we are sitting at home, self-isolating, um, I would like to remind you that the world outside is actually coming to life again. The days are getting longer, the trees are starting to sprout, the birds are courting like crazy and even the rustling in the undergrowth if you go out on your walks is busy as never before and when we look at these things we actually remember that despite this exceptionally hard time we are living the world around us is giving us new signs of new life and they give us new energy and new hope and we can sense that there's always renewal and regrowth and rejuvenation and rebirth and in this season of spring, I thought it would also be nice to share with you a couple of stories about traditions that we observe here in Canada and around the Western Hemisphere, many of which we claim to be our own, but which may actually have traditions elsewhere in the world and particularly in what we now call the Islamic world. Two topics I would like to introduce you today. Uh, to today. One considers the Easter rabbit, the other considers the origin of the Easter egg. Let us start with the rabbit, or rather hare, which is in fact one of the animals that are most frequently depicted in Islamic art too. And we find examples like on my slide from 11th century Egypt on the left, and 14th century Syria and 17th century Mughal India on the right. The rabbit or hare was particularly popular in the southern Mediterranean and especially in Egypt. And it's fascinating that in Egypt we can actually trace the use of the hare motif back over some 5,000 years and it was clearly associated all those times with fertility, rebirth and regeneration. In fact, its ancient Egyptian hieroglyph, which you can see here on the upper left, shows a hair over a single ripple of water. Its meaning was simply to be, and, the, and it stood for the very essence of life itself. Little figures of hares were placed in tombs as symbols of rebirth as early as the 3rd millennium BCE in the hope that their regenerative powers might help the deceased to be reborn into the afterlife. Hare amulets, meanwhile, were worn in the belief that the animal's speed and keen senses might offer effective protection against the forces of darkness. Beliefs like these survived in Greco-Roman Egypt and indeed into the early Christian period, a time uh, in around the first century CE. In early Christian times, the ancient beliefs started to merge with the new religions, newly introduced beliefs, beautifully symbolized by the little textile fragment I'm showing you here on the right. The hair remains associated with rebirth, eternal life, and revival, but it now also is associated with the resurrection of Christ at Easter. 
So, over thousands of years, these associations have persisted in the popular beliefs of Egypt. And today, the Easter Bunny still forms an integral part of Egypt's spring festival known as Shamanassim. Today, Shamanassim, of course, is a national, rather a religious holiday, and it is celebrated by all religious communities alike. It is a spring festival that again goes back many, many centuries and it today merges popular Islamic, Coptic Christian and ancient Egyptian spring traditions. To this day, Shaman Nassim is celebrated on the Coptic Christian Easter Monday in April and the celebrations include outdoor picnics and the consumption of plenty of food including some very specific foodstuffs, which I'm showing you on the left here. And all of these, interestingly, also already documented from ancient Egypt. They include fasikh, a fermented, salted and dried grey mullet, lettuce, green onions, lupin seeds and coloured boiled eggs. All of these foodstuffs were already mentioned by the Greek historian Plutarch in the first century as items that the ancient Egyptians were accustomed to offering as symbols of fertility to their deities during their ancient spring festival, which was known as Shemo and stood for renewal of life. It was also understood to mark the beginning of world creation. Fascinatingly, Dyed and decorated eggs were already among those offerings too. They have been discovered in pharaonic temples and tombs as symbols of new life and regeneration. And fascinatingly too, similar customs and similar eggs, like the ones I'm showing you in this slide, were also found across the southern Mediterranean, ancient Iraq and Iran. Coming back to Canada, Iranian and many other communities with roots in West and Central Asia still use colored and ornamented eggs as symbols of fertility and new life in their very own spring festival, Nowruz. I hope you enjoyed my little talk about Easter bunnies and painted Easter eggs and I wish you a wonderful holiday weekend. Enjoy the world outside as much as you can and remember that regeneration is happening all around us and that the world is still a beautiful place if only we stop and stare for a while. Take good care, stay safe, stay healthy and have a wonderful time. So remember you can watch uh, a longer version of this short piece that you just saw uh, a lecture, a full lecture by Dr. al uh exploring these fascinating traditions around spring in a lecture on our YouTube channel. And you can find other lectures and other content there as well. So please uh, take some time and visit our the Aga Khan Museum YouTube channel where you can see more of this material. Next up is a performance by Kia Tabassian and Hami Nonari, who are both artists that uh, currently live in Montreal. And they created this uh, piece together, performing a classical Persian dastaga called uh, uh, Dastga e Humayun, which is one of the major uh, scales uh, that is performed in uh, classical Persian music. And it's often pre performed at important occasions and uh, is very popular. So. Uh, you'll notice how just like spring, it starts off slow and it slowly builds uh, into this very virtuosic kind of weaving together of percussion and the Persian sitar. I hope you enjoy it.
So the natural world has not only been an inspiration in terms of uh, some of the content in our collection and across Islamic art and, and for that matter art from around the world, but also many of the materials that are used uh, in objects that are from our collection and of course in art from around the world have been created from materials that are found in nature. And so these next two pieces are part of our Public Curates series where we ask members of the public uh, to comment on their favorite object in the collection. And we have two of them, one by Bashir Lalani, who is looking at a work that uh, is made from a leaf, and uh, Philip Geisler, who is looking at a work that is made from a seashell. Hope you enjoy. Different people experiences life differently and the journeys that they endure also are different in many ways, depending on the circumstances. In 1929, my dad left India at a very young age and went by boat across the Indian Ocean to the coastal town of East Africa, from where he had ultimately made his destination to settle into Uganda. In 1972, he experienced a different journey, and a journey that was completely unexpected, one that was forced upon him and likewise many other hundreds and thousands of people who had to leave Uganda as refugees and make their final destination. Well, in my dad's case, that happened to be Canada. My own experiences was a little different. And at a very young age in 1971, I went to the United Kingdom to pursue my education. And in 1978, I decided to join my family in, in Canada, where we made our permanent home. And when I came across this beautiful art object at the Aga Khan Museum in Toronto, it is the 19th century chestnut leaf from Ottoman Turkey. It depicts a beautiful inscription shaped in a boat, signifying a journey. Now, this particular journey is, is that of the Holy Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, and it is referred to in the Quran as the Surah al-Isra, the night journey of the Prophet. Many people have traveled far and wide and made their different journeys either through their own choice or frequently through forceful situations due to wars, due to political upheaval, whatever the circumstances, and they end up in Canada. So life is such that the journeys begin and end, but we don't know what the final destination is going to be. It is interesting to see and how you can relate one's journey differently on different times is an interesting one and to understand what the final destination is going to be is also a question mark for me. Hello, I'm Philip Geisler and uh, I'm connected with the Aga Khan Museum through my doctoral research in art history. Um, right now, this is a time in which we are bound very much to our homes and the geography of our direct neighborhoods. For me, I thrive in memories right now of distant friends and family and of also past journeys in this time in which traveling is not really possible. And as many people do, and me too, I also sometimes have taken something home from past travels that serves as a portal or um, an entry way into a certain memory. Uh, I think that especially when trips bring us close to the shores of the sea, many people take something with them, um, a stone that they find at beaches, uh, or they take a shell. It's something that later stimulates our memory and creates a real sense of place or of time 
that is now distant. Um, to me, very personally, the beauty of objects can sometimes be found in how an object speaks about such interactions between humans and non-humans, um, or human and non-human agency. Um, for example, when an object triggers deep memories uh, or belief. Um, I find that such objects show in so many ways how humans and their environments have interacted and these objects are also often just very beautiful in terms of their material uh, and especially in terms of matter, uh, the matter they are made of. And that is why my favorite object so far of the Iron Khan Museum's collection is the Mother of Pearl Shell that is incised with Quranic verses and prayers and um, these uh, verses and prayers are very hard to read. They're very small inscriptions and there is definitely one famous verse of the third surah of the Quran on it that speaks about forgiveness. And the same surah also talks about protection and how material things will perish and are not everlasting. And I find the shell as an evocation of that to be so fitting because just as the surah says, uh, the animal that lived in the shell perished and left its protective body as a trace for us. Um, what I find so wonderful about this shell is how much its beauty draws you in. Uh, and that beauty to me is not just visual, but also the many ways in which it is associated with the environment, how it is in fact, um, or how it in fact associates us and maybe our beliefs with the natural world. And it has certainly been a place of peace for me during COVID to find a quiet and pretty place in nature. And the shell reminds me of that. So um, first I see an object that uses the natural shape of a shell and that really engages light in the most marvelous ways that uh, reflects in so many colors through its mother of pearl lining. Uh, the shell also has concentric circles um, and these circles don't only have verses, but also floral scrolls um, or a vine tendrils. So the shell actually opens a connection of the matter of sea and the matter of land. And it really blurs the boundary between nature and human making. And I find this opening up of ambiguity really ex exciting. Um, it's blurring boundaries between land and sea, between script and ornament. Um, and between something at once very connected to the earth and something very transcendental. And that's to me part of its beauty and its shimmering depth. Um, it fascinates me how people approach and use the matter that the earth gives us to forge something that reflects our position towards this earth. And some of the depth and beauty of the shell I find is also that it so closely entangles matter and meaning because the main association, um, the memory that this object evokes for me, besides the Quran itself, the promise of forgiveness, is really water. Um, the water that forged this shell as the protective body of an animal. Uh, water that nourished the mollusk that uh, lived in it. Water um, that also brought it into human hands and on which the shell might have traveled. Uh, in fact, it might be that this shell was even used as a drinking vessel. So there was water in it. Um, and it was used as a vessel in religious blessing rituals, a form of protection, uh, just like the shell itself. So that's really what makes this object so special for me. It speaks about the spiritual role of the earth and of water, uh, water as a life giver, uh, and that really evokes the quintessence of the world, which is the substance that makes up over half of our bodies uh, and the thing we cannot live without. And that evocation happens through the matter of the shell. So this shell for me is not only a trip into memory, um, but it is also a returning to that from which we have come, to that from which we are made. And today it is sadly very fitting that um, the verse in the shell talks about forgiveness um, and uh, that the shell with that reminds us of the state of the earth today. Um, so that's my fascination with this object, that it brings together so many ecological and spiritual dimensions that say that every work of art has an environmental significance, uh, and by that it also essentially says that without the earth there is no art, so we better take good care of it. Thank you, Philip. Thank you, Bashir. Next up, we have a conversation between Dr. Phyllis Shakir Philip 
and Marianne Fenton, both who work at the museum, talking about the tulip and its importance, its significance. You know, it appears in our collection in many objects and throughout Islamic art. It has an interesting history, and I hope you enjoy this uh, this segment, uh, this conversation between Marianne and Phyllis. And then finally, we will have another part to the, of that concert with Kia Tabassian and Amin Onari. And if you remember, I mentioned how the piece slowly builds, and uh, as it uh, builds, it reaches this this, this peak. Uh, the Persian classical piece re reaches this, this crescendo near the end, and so that's what you will see as we, we end our program, our content for this episode. I hope you enjoy it. Hello, everyone. I welcome you all. My name is Phyllis Chakur Philip, and I am today with Mariana Fenton, who was the co-creator of the exhibition Don't Ask Me Where I Am From, and it's currently on view at the Aga Khan Museum. The topic of our conversation today is all about one single flower, namely the tulip, which was offered so many interesting conversation between the two of us in the past. One of the reasons to select this topic for today's conversation is, as you all know, the celebration around the tulip during the month of May. We thought it, it would be a good idea to talk about this elegant flower to uplift our mood and create joyful anticipation for this time of the year. Marianne, I know you have a special interest on Tulip. Would you like to add something onto that? Yes, firstly, thank you so much for inviting me to join you. Um, we've had wonderful conversations, as you said, and it's so exciting to be able to share some of this uh, with a larger audience and, and to learn more from you because I know that you're very, very knowledgeable. Um, so I th without further ado, I'm going to share our PowerPoint um, so that we can look at some of the beautiful images that you have included in this. Right. So Phyllis, um, I've become a little obsessive about gardening and I'm particularly interested in where plants come from. The tulip has become very strongly associated with being a Dutch plant. But I know from our many conversations and from some research that I've done myself, it has a tantalizing secret history. Tell me, where is it actually from? <laughs> yes, uh, indeed, tulip has a fascinating story in different cultures and countries. It's uh, originally a wild flower from the steppe of Central Asia. The earliest depiction of tulips as part of the repertoire of artisans and artists uh, we discover in the medieval period uh, during the Seljuk Empire, which stretched uh, from Anatolia and the Levant in the west to the Hindu Kush in the east and uh, from the northern part of Central Asia to the Persian Gulf in the south. So as you can imagine, a vast territory in the global landscape. I, I have chosen uh, one specific image I would like to share with you in this context, uh, an uh, image of uh, a mihrab uh, from Konya in Turkey, which was uh, the co capital of the Seljuks. This mihrab from Behekim Mosque uh, is one of the most impressive examples found in, in Anatolian architecture of the Seljuks and was constructed during the, thir during the 13th century. I show this just to point out how early the tulip uh, appears in an abstract form in arts of Anatolia. Then uh, if we move further in the history of tulip uh, in 14th century, it was uh, incredibly important for the race of Ottomans and who eventually conquered the city of Constantinople in 1453 and uh, led by uh, Sultan Mehmed II. Uh, the old Ottoman historians uh, uh, mention him as uh, Mehmed the Conqueror. According to historic sources, he gave order to establish new gardens uh, and park while renovating the architectural buildings of the city, as well as to it intensify the cultivation of tulips. When the Ottoman Empire reached the Golden Age in the 16th century, during the reign of Sultan Suleiman the Magnificent, 
tulip were highly appreciated as one of the chief floral motifs in the repertoires of artists in any kind of media. And this is also one of the reasons why I want to show these two images. Uh, in one, you can see a candlestick shaped in a tulip, and the other is an Ottoman courtier holding a, a tulip in his hand, uh, uh, how elegant uh, the flower looks like. So um, I have a question for you about the, the image on the right. Um, I would never have thought that that's a tulip necessarily. Uh, so I love that you're pointing out that that is in fact a tulip. And I've noticed in much of the imagery that we've looked at so far, the tulip shape is slightly different to how we've um, sort of become, no, become more familiar with. The, the, pe the petals are just pointier. Um, is there a story behind that? Yes, indeed. Uh, tulips came in different varieties and it has much to do with aesthetic understanding of the Ottomans. You see in this slide how elegantly this uh, Ottoman courtier uh, from the palace holds the tulip in his hands, uh, emphasizing the fragility of this sophisticated flower. The standards of the Turkish florist were uncomprising and they, were, uh, they preferred only tall and thin tulips. And this is a very significant example for this kind of uh, tulips. So uh, the, uh, the aesthetic of Ottomans um, was really looking for this kind of tulips. And you're right, the pedals uh, are very thin and they had to be smooth and stiff. The proportion of the pedals, uh, ped uh, the exact size and the length, including the narrow pointed tips, were taken into consideration uh, when the florist evaluated the quality and the beauty of the tulips. So, um, what are some of your other favorite images um, of objects? You know, I, my interest on tulip is, uh, it is a, such an interesting pattern and it creates such a motif for entire uh, artistic creation. And you see in this slide uh, three different variation of uh, material. And it shows also how um, flexible the artist where to use uh, similar patterns or similar motifs uh, in different medias. One is uh, uh, Ottoman kaftan, um, uh, you see the tulip shape. The other is Iznik dish uh, uh, from our collection in the Aga Khan Museum, uh, where the tulip were combined with uh, carnations uh, and elegant plants. And the other is uh, chamfron, um, which I like very much uh, uh, considering uh, the aggressive expand military expansion of Ottoman um, Empire and uh, how it was uh, threatened in Europe and uh, this elegant uh, chamfron which is protection for horse forehead elegantly depicted uh, and ornamented with tulips. I absolutely love these images. They're so beautiful and so descriptive of the tulip shape um, that I've now become more familiar with. Um, but what I really, really am curious about, uh, as someone who comes from a more of a Western art history, is how on earth does a tulip get to Europe or the West? And where does the European fascination with this flower begin? I think uh, one of the reasons, of course, uh, when they were uh, in uh, having international uh, affairs with the Ottoman court, they were affiliated with the, with the pattern of the Ottoman artists and they were uh, also learning from their repertoire. But on the other hand, through the uh, diplomatic uh, affairs, uh, m many of uh, European courts uh, have sent uh, also their ambassadors to uh, Istanbul. Um, and this gave, of course, uh, many ambassadors uh, the uh, the possibility to uh, walk around and in the city and see gardens and park and, uh, uh, and they started to understand the fascination of the Ottomans regarding this uh, flower and um, then they reported back to home and uh, one of the earliest uh, source, historic sources in this uh, context uh, we know in the uh, mid 16th century Busbeck, the ambassador of the Holy Roman Empire, uh, he was sent to Istanbul and uh, it, from 1554 uh, uh, until 1562. 
and uh, he uh, reported back to home and explaining that uh, he saw some flowers, they look like iris, but they are not iris, and the Ottomans love this uh, flower so much, and uh, this kind of uh, interesting uh, information exchange uh, brought uh, Tulip into Europe. That's so interesting. Um, but there's something else. The tulip, to me, is very strongly associated with the Dutch. And certainly, I think if you ask most people where they think the tulip comes from, they'd say it's, it's a Dutch flower. Um, how come? Uh, uh, the contemporary reason is uh, one, uh, the Netherlands is one of the major supplier of uh, cut flowers, namely the tulip, as we know today. But in historic context, uh, uh, I want to refer back uh, to Busbeck again, and uh, when when he mentions uh, the tulip in his report back to home, he is mentioned also the tulip as a tulipa turcarum. And uh, after uh, the first tulip arrived in Europe, uh, then spread from Vienna to Antwerp, Paris, and London. And interestingly, uh, a different variation of fascination, as we saw in Ottoman art, developed in Netherlands. And I think this is also the, one of the reasons um, that we are uh, connecting Tulip with Netherlands. Um, and I've got this wonderful image on the screen that you selected, um, one by Henrik Putt. Um, and I know that this has got to do with a very particular moment in history called Tulip Mania that occurred um, in the Netherlands. Uh, what can you tell us about Tulip Mania? Uh, it's a very interesting phenomenon uh, happening in uh, Dutch uh, history and art history. Uh, when the uh, first tulip, uh, tulips arrived in the Netherlands, uh, of course we are talking about port cities first uh, through the trade, and uh, uh, they, they be, uh, because they were so exotic and uh, uh, they didn't have any knowledge about this flower, so they started to uh, create uh, fantasy stories around this flower. And uh, so we faced with uh, um, this kind of phen phenomenon, uh, the tulip, ma tulip mania or uh, tulip fever in Dutch uh, um, history. What happened is uh, people could uh, sell and buy tulip bulbs without seeing them. So they were promised to uh, come up uh, in next spring or so, but they were already part of the trading uh, um, culture in Dutch uh, society. And uh, that make, of course, uh, some of the families, uh, brought uh, some of the families in trouble because they were trading with a non-existing subject in our context, tulip, and dangerous speculation brought, of course, financial ruin for uh, families. On the other hand, uh, who uh, was aware about this uh, flower and couldn't afford to buy this flower, they were interested to have at least the painting of the flower in their interiors, in their home. And um, this painting from uh, Hendrik Pot uh, shows uh, um, a very um, allegoric uh, description of uh, Tulpomania and uh, pa the painting was ex executed light, right after, after the money <laughs> in, in Netherlands, so to speak, and you see uh, Flora, the goddess, uh, carrying bouquets of uh, uh, tulip uh, in, his, in her hands and uh, uh, guiding people to the, into the ocean. And uh, this is the how uh, uh, artists uh, saw the, um, uh, the situation in the Netherlands and uh, of course uh, uh, how he disqueezed uh, and uh, he, uh, he did in, in a very satiric way. I, I, I absolutely love this painting and I, um, I love that it shows the kind of the craziness of this particular moment in time. Now um, I love uh, tulips and these paintings are some of my favorite favorite paintings where we have these images of these beautiful variegated tulips and, and this one in particular which is from the great tulip book actually shows the, the price that was paid for the bulbs um, in the bottom corner um, and 
the, the funny thing is that uh, the reason that these tulips were so beautiful is because they were all infected by a disease called the tulip breaking disease, which meant that every time they came out, they came, they grew differently and looked different, uh, which was in some ways probably helped just to make the, the entire tulip craze um, what it was. Indeed, it's a very good observation, Mariana. The, the tulip could uh, change its color seemingly at will, and that, that's what people believed in, in that time. And interestingly, this um, a plain color, uh, colored flower, for example, a red uh, tulip uh, might emerge the following spring in a completely different uh, geese. The petals uh, feathered and flamed in intricate patterns of uh, white or deep red um, and this kind of breaks in color were caused by a virus as you mentioned which was unknown to the 17th century tulip lovers and didn't uh, become known until the late 1920s actually the most astonishing part of the story of tulip includes outrageous prices uh, for those color uh, broken tulips. It's so amazing uh, how people consider uh, the uniqueness of this disease uh, as beauty, uh, beautiful. Each uh, superbly complex uh, color pattern was originally as a fingerprint and could not be controlled, of course. Mm, that's so amazing. Um, but of course, Tulips continue on in our imagination and in many ways um, and in art history and in art and in many ways that's what, what, how the fascination continues and why we're having this discussion today. Um, and these famous 19th century uh, impressionists certainly, certainly sort of illustrate some of this. I really like um, Manet, so I'm a bit of a sucker and always want to include something by him if I have to speak about an impressionist. <laughs> um, and in this very, very simple uh, bouquet of flowers. He has tulips and roses paired together. And on the right, of course, Claude, Claude Monet, who, like anyone else who has had the opportunity to see the tulip fields in the Netherlands, couldn't resist painting the incredible colors on display. How do you see uh, the combination of your interest in the flower itself, but its appearance, uh, let's say, in contemporary art? Uh, well, I think as a, as uh, you know, from a personal perspective as an artist, I love um, botanical illustrations and that kind of close depiction of objects that become almost abstract in their depiction. Um, and, and just that close looking that occurs in, in so many different ways. But uh, in terms of the tulip, I think it has so many layers of this rich history, but also that it doesn't just permeate art, it actually ends up permeating interior design as well. Um, I, I, I love these, these images of, of chairs that have been designed and have been inspired by the tulip shape. And I know we've had a few discussions about this too. Absolutely, and I think uh, uh, looking at the Ottoman art and then how they were fascinated by the shape of a uh, tulip and created, for example, the candlestick that I show, uh, um, uh, before and then looking at in uh, in our time in contemporary and in, into early 20s then you see the appearance of the shape of the tulip in interior design and then that that fascinates me also because uh, it shows also the continuation of the interest of artists uh, uh, by making of uh, beautiful um, artworks and considering mother nature and including the shapes of the flowers in their concept Yes, and then, um, you know, in terms of contemporary art, I, I had a good look to try and see which other artists have the same um, interest in, uh, in tulips. And I don't think that it comes up so specifically, but there is one artist who really has made a big deal about it. Um, Jeff Koons uh, has created various versions of these, the tulips on the left. Um, he, it's in a, there are many editions of it. This one is in the Broad Museum. Uh, and on the right is uh, a, a very new installation of a public monument that's been installed in the Petit Palais in Paris in 2019, a bouquet of tulips. And it actually commemorates the victims of the 2015 Paris terror attacks. Now, love it or hate it, this is fantastic. And then you are showing the beautiful uh, image of our <laughs> museum with the tulips. Uh, please tell me about this. 
Well, I think um, much like you, I, I love how a tulip can be not just uh, the actual flower, but the various symbolisms that it carries with it that shifts and changes through the various centuries. Um, and in this instance, uh, we have the privilege of having this, these beautiful flowers planted um, at the museum, which is in fact a gift from the Dutch embassy, um, or, the, or the Dutch consulate rather. And it also ties in with the bigger story because Canada has a relationship with tulips, uh, a very special relationship with tulips that, that dates all the way back to the Second World War. Um, the two countries really supported each other through this and um, it sort of became a symbol of peace. So when Europe was suffering under Nazi occupation, Canada provided a safe shelter for the future Dutch queen, Juliana, in 1943. And Princess Magritte was born in Ottawa. In 1945, the Dutch royal family sent 100,000 bulbs to Ottawa as a symbol of gratitude, which continued in the years after. And of course, with so many bulbs, gradually uh, Ottawa became famous for its tulips. Uh, and in 1953, the Ottawa Board of Trade decided to create a Canadian Tulip Festival. So I love how this is now a sign of international friendship and peace, and how fitting that it's planted at the museum that really does try to bridge cultures and uh, sort of just uh, get rid of notions of ignorance and to connect people. So, um, mm -hmm. and, and, and also the other connection that, you know, as a, as a museum of kind of Islamic and Muslim culture that we tie back all the way to the Ottomans. Speaking of friendship, I know you have a very special friendship uh, uh, regarding your gardening. <laughs> <laughs> you know me so well, Phyllis. So I have always aspired to have a garden full of tulips, just like the one at the museum. But instead, this has been my experience. I have not had much luck with tulips because of furry friends who visit my garden and are determined to make sure that nothing that I plant grows. <laughs> but I'm, I'm very happy at least you can see the tulips and adore them and uh, use as inspiration when you work uh, at the museum. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, thank you, Phyllis, for this wonderful conversation. I really thank appreciate you for it. For your participation and for your contribution. And I wish you a good day. Thank you, and I hope everyone enjoyed listening to this.
Wow, that was incredible. Thank you, Kia. Thank you, Hamin. And thanks to all of you for watching this episode devoted to spring uh, at, at the Aga Khan Museum. And I hope to see you next month uh, where we'll be presenting another episode. And in the meantime, you can visit our Museum Without Walls and check out our other programming, our YouTube channel as well. Our website is agakhanmuseum.org.org. Uh, I hope you have a chance to, to take part in some of the programming that we have online. And uh, looking forward to when we can welcome you physically back into the museum. And happy spring. Navroz Mumbarak.